What the hell am I doing? Welcome back to another episode of I Have No Idea What I'm Doing. My name is Paula Rogo and I'm your host. In this episode, we'll be talking about money and about how women entrepreneurs should approach money and funding to grow their companies. And I'll be honest, money scares me. And as I work to build Kali Media, I especially struggle with how to find and navigate financing in this business. But I realized early on that there's no way I could start and grow my company until I improved my relationship with money. But I still had a lot of questions like, is my company even eligible for financing? If so, how do I access it? What types of funding are out there? And why can't I just use my savings? To help us figure this out today, we have Wakiru Njuguna, the Finance and Investment Manager of Hiva Fund, an organization that invests in and supports the creative economy sector in East Africa. She's joining us via Skype today. Welcome, Wakiru. Thank you. Glad to be here. Also with us is Andia Chakava, an independent investment professional with over 15 years of experience in foreign and African funding. She's also the investment director of the Grasa Michelle Trust, and she chairs the Kenya chapter of the New Faces, New Voices Women in Finance Initiative. She's here with me in our studio in Nairobi. Welcome, Andia. Thank you. All right, ladies, I'll admit that I'm both excited and a little terrified to jump into this episode. And I'm sure there are many women out there who really believe that they're not money or number people. So I want to start by talking about women and their relationship with money. And Andia, I will start with you. You work with the Grasa Michelle Trust, which recently did a survey that explored the growth barriers faced by female entrepreneurs here in East Africa. And so generally speaking, what kind of relationship do women have with money and how does it affect our business decisions? Women, I would say they are avid savers. They're always looking for that rainy day and they and they love to invest in fact a lot of the women we asked how many women in the survey how many of you belong to a network that's another thing women operating groups uh we asked them 50 percent of them belong in a network when we asked them what is the primary function of your network 70 percent of it had got to do with savings and investment so a lot of women are saving and investing but in terms of now saying i am also going to now risk some of this money and, you know, risk some of that money and put it in some kind of take a loan. What they do is that they bet on themselves because at least 71% of these women are self-financing their businesses. Where is this money for self-financing coming from? Their savings. There are savings that they have, they accumulate, they take it. When you ask women, where do you want to to grow like when when you when your business is growing where do you think your first source of money will come from and this is the point of departure between male and female entrepreneurs females no loan they're like my savings still what does that mean how far can you go with your savings Ultimately, you're going to need some form of external capital. And part of the reasons they don't seek that external capital, because women do this to themselves even in job interviews, we look at the checklist and we say, We don't qualify for everything. And Waikiru, your organization, uh, the Heva Fund, deals with the creative economy. Um, Can you tell us a bit about your sector and... um, what it, what money is coming in there and whether women have access to it as well. Actually, the reason why we we originally decided to start investing in the creative economy was because there was really no money that was coming into the sector. If you look at what traditional um, investors were investing in, even up to now, you will have to have a long conversation about where you want to uh, invest in, in the creative economy. I'll give you an example. I once went for um, a meetup for, for people who, like people in venture capital, venture capitalists, and we had a long conversation with these people. First of all, we were only two women. That's the two, me and a colleague of mine who work at who works at Hiva as well. The other thing was when they asked us, so which fund do you represent? Then we said Hiva fund. Then they asked, oh, so what does Hiva do? So we, we give them a, a breakdown of what Hiva does. And what they said was, oh, so you're the girls who are investing in, in dresses. 
And we're like, what? Dresses. Oh <laughs> that's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's it's actually that's the type of that's the type of um view people have of the creative economy in terms of it's just about dresses, it's just about like uh, clothes. But then there's such a wide uh, there's such a wide uh, description of what creative economy is and how much it's bringing into the economy. Uh, but then there are no studies that are being directed towards the exact contribution, how many people are being employed, how many women, how many youth. So what we felt was that there was such a misunderstanding of what the creative economy was. Um, and then if you look at the traditional uh, investors like banks, they are very uh, risk averse. And so they feel like the creative people in the creative economy are not able to, to pay back loans or they are very erratic or something so then that they can't have a conversation about money so that's what we were trying to demystify and and see whether we could shift the conversation to actually this is a very um, good opportunity to invest and create jobs would you say there's a gender bias as well are women accessing these this money i think the gender bias happens it it, it happens um at the point of, I would say, decision-making. But when the money comes, I would say the money has not necessarily been coming for women by women. I think what we are doing now at the Gresham Michelle Trust or with New Faces, New Voices, and some of the emerging gender lens investing funds is to create that bias in the money. And, you know, people may say, well, why are you creating that bias? Money is money. Because the reality is when you look at how the money is deployed and the businesses that do get funding, regardless of the sector biases that already exist, there is a tendency for, I would say, like to attract like, which means that if a lot of the people that are giving the funding are male investors, they might most probably feel more confident or be more aware of other male entrepreneurs. Um, I think we'll be getting it later in terms of the visibility of female entrepreneurs, uh, the networking opportunities that are kind of available. So we are actually forcing and... um, and creating the gender bias in money to us, which we believe we'll see a lot more women participating. But if we were to sort of break down sort of the three main areas, the three main barriers to women in accessing funding for their businesses, what what would you say those three would be uh, based on data as well as just your own general experience? So when we did like aggregate sort of growth barriers uh, that weren't related to funding. It's it's access to finance was top, and then there was access to markets, Mm -hmm. and and then the other had to do with just access to the right human resource in order for them to grow. We then unpacked the access to finance. Uh, We suspected it was going to be one of the big ones there, and we asked them what is what are the big ones under access to finance, and it it really came back to two main factors. One of them was um, interest rates, and the others had to do with um, collateral. And I'll talk about uh, both of them because they they both, um, in terms of um, when we look at, if I discuss interest rates and we look at both the demand and, and the supply side, I think we have... We have areas that both can meet and talk to each other. So if I go on the supply side, there was criticism in terms of just the bureaucracy within the process, how long it takes to basically get a loan approved. But by the time your business is either dead or it's either done, Um, I think there were also um, really concerns about the terms of the money available. The fact that if they did qualify for that particular amount and the loan, they would be entitled to almost start paying back immediately. Yet a lot of people were looking for grace periods. They were looking for breathing spaces. Um, Now, those are things that can be negotiated customer to customer, but it's very specific and it might happen, it might not happen. Um, I think, again, on the supply side, people felt that there was no targeted marketing that said, hey, I'm a bank that specializes in 
women in manufacturing. I'm a bank that specializes in women in media. Regardless of your stage, I can help you. Where do I go? That's the thing. Where do- Are you advert? As in, I just know for me personally, I- it, with this company, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to go ask for a loan, but. Who, who do I go to? Why am I doing so much research? Thank you. And you would almost think, just to build in your, your comment, you would almost think that whoever you bank with should be the natural person that you would go to. And women said that they felt they were treated as strangers, as new clients again. So they had been banking as individuals. They now come business and they're expected to produce a, a track record that is consistent with that particular business, yeah. which is a new business. Yeah. And so it does call for... When you have a history already with the bank. Exactly. Right. And this is where I would say some of the people that are giving loans on the mobile side are able to translate your phone activity to your potential behavior as a customer. Right. So I think there's supply side challenges that have it necessarily. But on the demand side, I think we also have to be clear. Women themselves like say they don't have time now don't have time to what no they're busy we're, we're talking about people that are running homes they have they have kids they have husbands they're they're caregivers so it better be online it better be quick it better be predictable otherwise they're not gonna bother um i think on the demand side as well we have um this sense of this documentation. Now, I know supply side may ask for, what have you put on the table? Is it like a huge business plan? But a lot of people had incomplete documentation. So it's just a matter of how can I articulate? And it's not about having some thesis. I think it's about- About to change the world with this business plan. (laughs) I think it's just, you know, I think it's less than a five page of articulating, which also includes numbers about what is potential. A lot of people admitted to not having the appropriate documentation and things that also give investors confidence. Like, do you have a board of advisors? Do you also have audited financials? Now, there is a perception that these things are expensive, but I think there are ways to go around it so that your business can appear more structured in the eyes of the investor. So I would say there's both a demand and supply side discussion that needs to take place in order to actually channel the funding, not only to women, but to earlier stage and less predictable businesses. And Wakiru, based on what Andia just said, do you agree? Are you seeing the same things on your end? Yeah, um, the the issues are exactly the same uh, where... I feel like if you're designing uh, financial or loans for women, then you need to meet them where they are. So you need to figure out what type of women am I targeting? These are women who have are running homes, they're busy doing a million things. So it's about making it convenient for them to be able to access the loan or access the money. And I feel like that's why these uh, mobile loans are, are doing really well, because then uh, if it's a woman who's going to to marry Kitty in the morning, she just uh, goes to her emshuary and asks for maybe like five thousand shillings. She gets it. Then she's able to still pay back through her empesa or yeah. So then it makes it so easy for her as opposed to going to a bank, queuing, having to explain to someone why you need the loan and why you don't have collateral for that loan. And the issue of collateral, when you think about it, it's very also cultural. Like it's such a cultural thing because. Because if you look at our culture before, women did not own assets. So like even if you have a husband, everything would be in your husband's name or if you were living with, I don't know, someone. Like it was always very hard for women to have access to the collateral or the assets. Or even if you helped your husband buy the the piece of land, that you would have to have such a long conversation with him about how, why you should put up this this land as collateral or as security for a loan. And so I think it's about just figuring out how to make it easier for women to be able to access the money. Because when you look at the stats, women are the ones who pay back 
like they pay back really well even in, in in our portfolio of businesses they pay back the loans well yeah like all the women we have have done amazing with the money that we loaned we, we loaned them and that they've been able to come back and ask for even more um and they're the ones who like the communication is perfect they always tell us when they feel like they're going to to be late in terms of a payment when they're having issues with their business they'll come and ask and tell us what it is and ask us how we can help like there's so much it's it's so it's such a nice relationship when you're like lending to women because they communicate they tell you when they have issues uh they pay even if sometimes it's not necessarily on time but they pay because the thing about women is that they hate and I don't know if you guys feel the same way but I personally hate owning like loan uh owing someone money so I do what I can to make sure that I pay this money <laughs> on time or at a certain time and that they don't ask for money just for the sake of asking for money it's something that they've thought about they know okay i need about a million shillings i need to be able to buy these specific machines and i'll be able to pay back if a b c and d happen the way i think that it will happen and so i feel like um there's there's such a case for learning for women you just need to figure out what works for them and how to go about it because it feels very opaque i just know for me i'm like first of all where is the information it's you know you sort of pull it together and you piece it together um and then of course being someone who's like because i don't know everything i'm not going to step into it yet because i have to be an expert and a perfectionist in it before i even begin and what like you when also women come to you um for funding do you also feel that they are lacking in information as well. I noticed like with Have a Fund you did a great investment series on YouTube. Why did you feel the need to even put that investment series together? So we we get so many questions, phone calls from people asking about our investment process, about just general investment. And so we decided as opposed to having this call every day with different people, why don't we just put the questions together and put it up somewhere where people are able to access it easily and so we realized that facebook was the best platform to put it out there to put it out and so we just did short videos that were very straight to the point and answering all these questions that they had what were the most common questions that you ran into so some of the questions were what do i need to do to get investments uh what type of investments are out there for a business like mine uh what type of financial statements do i need to have or to keep uh, to be able to go to an investor and like have to show them what my business is like in terms of the financial side and then the other question was why am i not getting um the investment so that those were some of the questions that we were getting and you know it's so funny even just listening talking to you guys today the things you said where i'm like mm. I have not been doing that or oop I have made that mistake and the main one is just Andy when you said self financing that's the main way that women um finance their businesses but it limits um how far you can grow even though you said that I can still hear myself saying oh but I'll still self finance for a little <laughs> bit so like what what is it about self financing that limits how big you can grow how far you can take your company I think for us we encourage a lot of entrepreneurs to be very clear about what their growth strategy is mm-hmm. and what their uses of money are so and we did query this we did ask people give us an idea of how much money you need uh, i think there were a, bu- a bunch of people that attempted that question others that guess so i think the clarity on what you need and that is really dependent on what you're using the the money for we had a lot of people talking about purchase of equipment we had a lot of people talking about marketing and um sales and marketing we had people talking about product development we didn't have a lot of people talking about acquisitions where you're acquiring so uh, 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 lots of the women were more earlier stage just going in the growth stage when you actually put the uses of money down and realistically you don't you're not doing it on the basis of what you can afford but what the business realistically needs in order to generate a return that makes 
everybody happy. I think that's really important because I'm thinking this is what I can afford. So this is what I can do. Yes. So you limit yourself. So if you're only operating with what you can afford, trust me, you're just sort of um, moving little things around. Say, I do this. But if you were, if you had realistic, because we also have people asking for too big amounts and you're like, can you really absorb that? So it really makes you think about your business in a disciplined manner and just say, I'm able to do this as part of phase A growth. And then I move to phase B, phase C. Now, if you open that up to not only your own capital, but some form of external capital, I think even the growth numbers and the growth potential will actually be very interesting to the investment community. Okay, ladies, this is a really great conversation, but I just wanted to take a moment to announce the next Kali Media Project. In January, we'll be launching Kali Letter, a bi-weekly newsletter that is an unfiltered lens of news, pop culture, lifestyle, and feminism for East African women. It's like an email from your smart, funny, and savvy best friend right there in your inbox. You can go sign up for it now on the Kali Media website at www.kali.media slash Kali Letter. That's www.kali.media slash K-A-L-I-L-E-T-T-E-R. Now back to this great conversation. And let me just take a step back because we're talking about investment and funding. And I would really like to sort of talk about the different types that are out there. Just to list, I can go for a bank loan, microfinancing, SACOs, venture capital, angel investors, private equity, crowdfunding, peer-to-peer lending. There's a lot out there that you might have access to or you might not have access to. How do then I, as a business, decide what is best for me? What are the questions I should be asking myself in facing all these options? So I think, first of all, you need to know exactly how much you need and exactly what you plan on doing with the money. So then you're able to have an idea of, okay, should I go to a bank for this? Is it possible for me to get a a small loan from, I don't know, maybe Emshwari or something? Is it possible for for me to... um, approach my SACO. I am I am such a, a believer in SACOs, especially for people who want to get affordable money in terms of like have like yeah, just affordable money. So I think you need to think about what you want to do with the money and have that clearly stated. I assume that's common sense, but is that rare to just be sure of like how much you need? It's so rare. I'm telling you when you sit down with people who've come and asked you for a certain amount of money, then you ask them, okay, so what do you want to do with this money? Then they'll tell you, um, I really just wanted to buy maybe a car for to be able to make deliveries. And then you have, you reason, like, you're like, okay, so is it, does it make sense to have a car now? As in, like, it's, it's such a, it's such a long conversation I've had with, with business owner trying to figure out exactly the priority areas of where the money needs to, to go because they could be thinking that they need money for this but actually they need money for to go into hr or to go into into buying certain machines so that they can stop maybe leasing or 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 renting from someone else do you agree and yeah sort of clarity in why you want the funding and what it's for yes i mean certainly the the clarity on 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 the funding um i think a lot of businesses need to do that um that's why i think in terms of some people want to look for investment money actual money but there's a lot of people out there that's just providing technical assistance and i think we also need to start putting emphasis on having very structured programs that maybe don't have money Mm -hmm. but give advice that actually open your mind and give you the confidence to get that money. When you mentioned all the lines of funding, some of them are very popular in other parts of the world, whether it's crowdfunding or peer-to-peer lending. Here, when we describe crowdfunding, it's very much in a sympathetic manner. If you want Kenyans to contribute, it's about somebody, whoa, there's a, an impending surgery, you mobilize, and then people create this mchanga. But people do not necessarily mobilize when it comes to businesses. Uh, so we've got a sympathetic heart, and we do that very well. But do we do it when somebody is... We even have wedding committees. 
people will come together. You tell me where in the developed world people are going to put money together for you to get married. They're going to be like, what you chatting about? We do it. We need to look at business in that same manner of importance and say, you know what? This is a business, that sense of community. How do we mobilize this money? So to me, crowdfunding is a matter of levers. We use it, but we don't use it uh, appropriately from a business point of view. One company that we've talked to that used crowdfunding was Enda, the shoe company that had a great crowdfunding initiative that um, even when talking to the founder about it, um, she was like, people were also surprised at how well it did, or they were also surprised at the fact that they were interested in funding it. So I think they should be more of those non-traditional be forms. Creative. Be creative. So what I'm saying, when the business is growing, you're you're looking at, as, um, as what Kiwuru said, you're looking at your SACO. You're looking at a friendly angel investor. Uh, when somebody says, who's an angel investor? I'm saying, your neighbor can be an angel investor. It's really how you sell it. Look at the, the person in your community or somebody that you realize as, is doing relatively well and you feel comfortable that you can approach them. You need to be selling all the time. You need to be used to rejection all the time. You might as well start with the friends of friends around you. And that's how you, you gradually then build up and build your confidence and show the track record that banks would like to see. Uh, you're able to sustain microfinance. And I think what women said, in terms of microfinance, they did feel that microfinance, it's quite easy to get a loan, but the interest rates were too prohibitive. Yes. People found it was such an expensive way of operating. Mm -hmm. And some people also felt that it wasn't as catalytic, meaning that some of the amounts were limited. And if you're looking to transition from one side to the other, and of course, it doesn't have the ability to be patient. Now, let's go to grants. There's a lot of, I mean, there are some grants out there. And I, I, I don't want to say a lot, but they are there. Yes. But grants have their own way. <laughs> the, the proposal writing, the clarity. Yes. And not everybody's good at that. And in fact, we've been also putting pressure on the grant side to say, when you demand these things, you are only awarding Ivy League types, people that know how to re respond and work the system. But either way, while it hasn't been resolved, we have to meet each other halfway and say, well, how do you know who's giving money and what sort of impact and what sort of uh, what sort of progress do they want to see? Mm -hmm. So it does require a lot of research before you graduate to traditional, what I would say, venture capital, private equity, which really private equity only looks in if you're going to have a deal size over $5 million. Wakiru, I hear you agreeing with Andia, especially about the cost of funding. Can you add to that? Yeah, all the things you said are true in terms of um especially when it comes to the cost of financing. I think that's one of the things that prohibit people from, from accessing finance, um, and especially women. So even this, even if you look at Mshwari, if you really think about, or any other mobile banking, uh, mobile loaning app, if you look at the amount of interest that they actually get from, from from the loans, it's very high amounts. And so I think it's it's, and those small, like whether it looks like it's such a small figure that you've taken and you keep taking it maybe every week, every month, uh, it needs to make sense for your business. It needs to be that you're bringing in more money and that you're able to pay that, that cost of that finance and still have some money as your profit or a lot of money as your profit that's left. Um, so, yeah, I think cost of finance is one of those things that people need to really think about. I think the other thing that people need to also consider is what they are willing to give up because not I always say that not all not all money is equal so you could get money from from a uh, from someone, but then they'd like to take like 60% stake into your business or someone else who will say 20%. Like it's very, 
it's very different. So you need to think about all these things before you go out there and say, okay, I want to take money and I, this is the amount of money I want. I think especially in terms of strategy for your business. So for example, if you're at a point where maybe you've explored a market or you've explored a product and you're looking to go into another market and there's a potential investor who has experience in that market and they can assist you with that. Like, is it a strategic partnership where um, they help you grow into a certain area or do something that is part of your strategic plan or is it just about the money because sometimes it's not just about the money it's also about who is this person who's coming to sit on your board or to to say that they are also a, a director into your company do they have a good standing in the in the like do, are they is it someone who's well known is it someone who has good connections are they able to to let you or to help you with access to a certain thing that is very paramount to your business growing. Yeah, so it's not just about the money. It's also about where what you see your business growing into and who who do you feel would help you grow your business into that. And Markir, you have a lot of people who come in front of you asking for money, asking for funding. What are you looking for? How do you decide who to invest in? Definitely confidence. It's the ability to show that you, even if you don't know a certain thing, that you have people around you, you have experts around you who know that thing and are able to help you or help your company through it as well. Um, we also look at people who've already put something into the business first, like they already have, if they're asking for maybe one million shillings, they already have some amount of money that they're able to say, I am able to raise maybe like a hundred thousand shillings to show that you also have a stake in it. If something goes wrong, that you also have invested in it and it's something that you're very committed to and that you're passionate about. The other things that we look at that are a bit more tangible are things like um, your previous financial statements. Uh, Have you been keeping your books um, and what does that look like has your do you have a product because we don't necessarily uh, do the seed investment so then you need to have a product that's been tested in the market whether it's for six months or one year um, and how is it doing um, and then do you have a clear idea of your market is and what strategies do you are you implementing to make sure that you attract that niche market so if it's young people if it's older people like what are you doing about it you also look at the social media presence because in this day and age it's such a it's such a marketing tool those are the key things that we look at and what are some mistakes you see women making when it comes to financing their businesses one of the mistakes i would just say i I don't don't think it's a mistake it could be by design um i feel like um in terms of networking um so i think the ability to network beyond what i would say neighborhood and and school alumni groups yeah. and just to cut across now for us we we might not necessarily uh we don't do the club we don't do i mean the bars or the the after work drinks we, we we don't do the golf but we can find our niche especially when we need to network with a member of the other sex mm-hmm. And uh, I think we can be clever how that is done. It doesn't have to be done in the evening. But we can figure out from breakfast to lunchtime how we can increase that interaction. So what am I saying? Actively grow your network outside your familiar network. You have to deliberately put yourself in other circles that can bring you closer to your goal or can give you or introduce you to different people. And that's to open yourself up to new experiences. I'd also like to say the ability to put your hand up. And the put the hand up is you you come along and say, I'm looking for women entrepreneurs to talk about the business. It might not be developed. You might not already have gotten there, mm-hmm. but you just need to put yourself out there. You know, there's something about speaking it. There are risks with putting yourself out there because it does come with backlash. It does come with extra scrutiny. It does come with, you know, some extra pain. But if we've already built a community of support through the active networking, we are armoring ourselves and creating a bulletproof vest around any potential, you know, 
any potential things that may befall us once we put ourselves out there? I think the key thing to just add on to what Andy has said is mostly just confidence. And it's that confidence to put your hand up and say, so I'm doing this. This is what my business is doing. Um, it's the same confidence to be able to go into places that are mostly male dominated and, and have your voice heard and have your ideas heard as well. Um, it's the same confidence where you come up to talk about your business and you know about your you know about your numbers you know the history of your business and you're able to articulate it as well because you've seen I've seen so many women come up and say oh you know I'm really not good at, at this numbers thing but I'm like you just need to know them you know like you're running a business so you need to be the person who when you're asked what were your revenues like for the last couple of years you have the numbers just like that you know all the numbers you know what you need to be able to to get to where you want to go and also the confidence to make mistakes because women are so scared of I don't know if it's something that starts from when when we are small girls because sometimes I also see it in my daughter where she's so scared of making a mistake and I don't know if it's the same issue that little boys have but like as women we are so scared of the backlash we get once we've made a mistake but it's like you just need to go out there and make the mistake if it's a mistake then you learn from it and you know what not to do next time just to add on that you know investors like people that have made mistakes and have learned from them everybody has a windy road we just see them at the end the key thing is to demonstrate that you've learned from them or you've put in mitigating risks or now you're actually strengthening particular processes you don't want the mistakes to be very expensive and that's why you work with specialists and advisors but it's not a case of saying I made a mistake I don't qualify I don't deserve to put my hand up I think ultimately as especially when you're in an er, an earlier stage business you are the business and that ability to demonstrate that not only have they been able to get their own funding and use their own resources but get little pockets of funding from other people uh, just demonstrated that there was an active track record looking at you know customers that were active that were there and just saying that by the time somebody is appealing for investment They've gone a little bit further and they're demonstrating this is the road I'm on. Can you join me rather than can we build the road together? Get on board. I'm still going. <laughs> yes, get on board exactly. and or you get left behind. It's fine. I'm still on my way. I'm still doing what I need to do. Excellent ladies. Thank you so much for your amazing knowledge and insights on investing and funding. Here are my takeaways. First, do the work before you ask for money. Do you know how much money you actually need and when will you pay it back? Do you have a business structure and how are you going to grow your business? These are questions that you need to be ready to answer when it's time to ask for that money. Two, ladies, don't be shy when asking for external financing. We're good with money, but you have to ask for it. And three, be creative with how you raise your money. There isn't one way to do it. So use your networks and be confident. Thank you, Akiru Juguna, the finance and investment manager of Hiva Fund. Thank you. You can check out her YouTube series on investment at www.hevafund.com. And Andia Chakava, investment director of the Grasa Michelle Trust. She chairs the Kenya chapter of the New Faces, New Voices Women in Finance Initiative. Thank you, Andia. Thank you. You can learn more about her expertise on her personal website at andiachakava.com. And I know we talked a lot about different forms of investment. So to help you learn more, we created a handy table that breaks it all down. It's available on our website at www.kali.media. I have no idea what I'm doing is a Kali Media production. I'm your executive producer and host, Paula Rogo. Our producer is Halima Gikandi. Our production assistant is Mame Frimpong. The music for this show was created by Ejaya Joshua, a.k.a. Jopi the Chef. And we recorded this episode at the Nun on Record Studio and Mojo Productions in Nairobi. You can find the I Have No Idea What I'm Doing podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. It will also be available on our Kali Media YouTube channel. You can find out more information about this episode at www.kali.media. If you like it, tell a friend. I'm your host, Paula Rogo. Until next time. <laughs>